Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Lazy Real Talk. Happy Sunday. I hope you all had a great start of Sunday. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I, uh, I started to cough this morning, so I hope um, it should be fine. We should be, we should be able to get through this program. All right. Um, this program is actually a follow up from uh, from the program on August the 26th when I talked about Xi Jinping's mental state. So even though the thumbnail addresses the, the missing defense minister, and we'll talk about why Xi Jinping is afraid of the rocket force, but I really think this is a, a follow up to the last discussion we had on his mental state. Um, <clears throat> so... So today's talk will have three parts. First, we'll talk about is the defense minister missing? And then we'll talk about why Xi Jinping is particularly fearful of the rocket force. And then uh, we'll talk about is there a way out for him in his predicament? And um, so we'll get started. You know, during the summer, one of the biggest news about China is its missing foreign minister, right, Qing Gang. I think he may have a companion now. At least, at least one other minister is missing, if not more. And um, the first, the first one who's suspected of missing is China's defense minister, who who was promoted into that position this March. He's, so he's only been in that position for a number of months, Li Shangfu. And there are three sources that have disclosed this as of yesterday. So I haven't checked this morning. Maybe there are other sources that have confirmed this now. So let's talk about the, the first person. The first person who broke the news was a uh, Chinese political commentator, Cai, Cai Shenkun, who wrote on X, formerly Twitter, on September 7th, that the newly appointed Chinese defense minister has been has been under investigation on suspicion of corruption and serious breaches of disciplines. And another person who mentioned this, actually I have, uh, oh, actually I have screenshots. I do. Um, oh, I, I um, yeah, there is, um, you, you could find his post. This the, That one, the one I don't have here is in English. So this is the, uh, this is the Chinese post on September 7th by this Chinese commentator, commentator. And the other person who mentioned this is U.S. Ambassador to Japan, um, Ram Emanuel, who wrote also on Twix, on, on, on Twitter, X, Twix, what am I saying, on X. And he, compa he compared Xi Jinping's cabinet to Agatha Christie's novel, and then there were none, right? And this is what he wrote. He wrote, uh, I'm just going to read you what he wrote. You can Google it and find that. He said, first, Foreign Minister Qing Gang goes missing. Then the rocket force commanders go missing. And now Defense Minister Li Shangfu hasn't been seen in public for two weeks. Who's going to win this unemployment race? China's youth or Xi's cabinet? Um, so, and that's interesting. And you, here you have, um, you know, the, it's, diplomats are usually known for not making speculations or comments or criticisms about other countries' politics. So the fact that you have an American diplomat, you know, commenting on the missing of, um, China's defense minister is is very, I mean, broke the protocol and is very unusual. So that makes people wonder, well, where is the defense minister? Here's his picture. Um, on August the 15th, when he was given a speech at the Moscow Conference of International Security, he was last seen on August 29th Here's, here's him, attending the third China-Africa Peace and Security Forum. Um, now, <clears throat> by the way, after he took office this March, he visited Russia twice. People believe that he plays a cr critical role in coordinating the supply of war 
wartime materials um, to to Russia. Now, as far as as recent as August thirty first, people believe that he was still okay because the defense ministry's spokesman Wu Qian uh, condemned the United States for refusing to lift sanctions against PLA leadership, and we know Li Shangfu, the minister. Is the highest-ranking PLA officer sanctioned by the U.S.? So, you know, obviously, you know, when he was when his spokesman was defending him on August thirty-first, he was still okay. It's only been ten days. What、well, today is the tenth? Well, actually, it's only been seven days since the rumor of him being、um, being gone has been spreading. So, a week later, the seventh, you know, something has happened. So is he really missing in trouble? I think he is. The CCP's own media has predicted it,、um, and I think the minister himself knew it's coming. But he had, but he still had to go to Russia to to attend the security conference to finish his work before being taken away.、Um, now he's in trouble not because of his role as the as the defense minister, but as But because of his previous role as the head of the、uh, the equipment development department, now the PLA's weapons and equipment procurement information network released a notice on July twenty six, openly soliciting from the general public,、uh, quote, tips about irregularities and disciplinary re-、uh, disciplinary violations. In the equipment procurement bidding process, so think about it. Asking civilians to turn against the military is very unusual,、um, because even during the crazy days of the Cultural Revolution,、uh, when Mao launched a massive campaign to turn people against each other, to have people turn each other in, even during those days, Mao didn't let civilians. To target the PLA, he draw a line. He understands that once he mess up, once he you know he let the civilians to turn against the the PLA, he's st- he's gonna mess up the PLA, and it's dangerous for him. So Xi Jinping must be very frustrated, and he had no choice but to you know, but to open PLA's can of worms and and let the public to openly. Uh, turn against the PLA, and <clears throat> that announcement also said that the investigation goes as far back as October 2017. So that's six years early. I mean, six years ago, five and a half years. And this backtracking timeline is significant for Li Shangfu, the the missing defense minister, because <clears throat> excuse me. Because it coincides with his tenure at the equipment development department, he became the department head in September 2017, and the investigation backtracked to October 2017. He left the de- the equipment department to take office as the defense minister this March. Um, so it's very obvious that the investigation targets him. Um. Lee's trouble is that he's linked to the rocket force. We all know that the rocket force is in trouble.、Um, now, Lee started his PLA career at the Xichang Satellite Center after graduating from a military college, and he was promoted to the commander of the center at the age of forty-five. So he's he had been there twenty twenty、uh, some years before he became the head of the satellite center. And then in his ten years as the head of the Xichang Satellite Center, he oversaw several major rocket launches. After his after Xi Jinping's military reform, he was promoted to become the the、um, deputy commander of the newly established PLA Strategic Support Force. And one year later, he was promoted to the head of the Equipment Development Department, which is. Which has the same rank as a military branch, just like the navy, the air force, and the army, and the strategic force and the rocket force. So it has the same military rank, but it's not officially a military service. A、uh, service.
uh, because it plays a logistics role. So if you look at his career, it spans across the rocket force, the strategic force, and the equipment development department. All three departments are recently being investigated. And the center of the investigation is the rocket force, which relies heavily on the equipment, equipment development department and the strategic support force more than other military branches. Um, let's now watch a clip by a former PLA Navy um, officer, uh, Yao Chen, who described what has happened at the rocket force. So I'll play a little, uh, um, a one and a half minute clip uh, from, from Colonel Yao. Let me, let me add to it. Um, let me start from the very beginning. And let me make, make this bigger. Let me start from the very beginning. Okay. Uh, can you guys hear? I wonder. I wonder. Can you, you got? You guys can hear, right? Is the audio all right? Okay. Wow. I, I assume it's okay. Let me play this. Now, 就是说整个火箭军的高层全是外面调来的所以现在火箭军的情况还是中央军委年和调查组在这调查的非常细 What's interesting is he talked about Wei Fenghe, who you know is Li Shangfu's predecessor. Wei was the former defense minister, right? Who was also the first commander of the rocket force. Um, when I say first, meaning when when the second artillery corps uh, was promoted to become a separate military service after the military reform. <clears throat> Wei was appointed the first commander of the rocket force in roughly around 2015, 2016. So, and that's significant. So now the question is, you have two defense ministers that are being investigated that have been, you know, taken down by Xi Jinping. And that's a scary thought. And the worst it doesn't stop there, okay? And the, the reason I say that is the person who Xi Jinping trust, trusts the most in the PLA may also be in trouble. So now let's talk about the third source that reviewed the defense minister's removal. Let me go back to my slides. And oh, here, here it is, this one. So the third person who mentioned the disappearance of uh, Li Shangfu is a Chinese historian, Zhang Lifan, who posted a note written by a PLA insider on X. According to the note, of the three heads of the general equipment departments, two have been taken away for investigation, and one has turned himself in. Now, we know the general equipment department, uh, or in other words, that's maybe maybe i um that's not that's not i mean th that's how he wrote it but he's really referring to the the equipment development department um that's you know the the department that was established after the military reform that li shangfu was was a formal boss of so it has it has had only three chiefs Right, Li Shangfu was the previous one, and the current one is uh, Xu Xueqiang. 
And the one, the first one, was guess who? Zhang Youxia. So if that post said is true, if because the post said of the of all three, two of the three have been taken away, and one has turned himself in. So that means Zhang Youxia, the man that Xi Jinping trusts the most in the PLA, is also in trouble. Either he has turned himself in, or he has been taken away, because he is one of the three, and he is the first one. He's the first head of the the equipment development department. So, and that's a dreadful thought. I mean, not for us, but for Xi Jinping, right? And Zhang's father, Zhang is a, a princeling. His father and Xi Jinping's father fought together during the civil war, and they were both、um, senior PLA officers. The two families are close, and Xi Jinping has relied on Zhang to to take control of the PLA in the past ten plus years. So if Zhang has fallen, I don't know how much control Xi Jinping has over the PLA. So it's very hard for me to believe that that actually has happened. But on the other hand, I'm not surprised because if Li Shangfu has problems, and Li Shangfu's problems are spelled out, I mean, I mean, there's just so much、uh, evidence pointing to his inevitable downfall, right? So if he has so many problems, Zhang Youxia will be held responsible because if you study. Their career path, you could see that Zhang has promoted Li throughout his career, and and if you if you follow, yeah, like I I I looked at their their career track, you see that when Zhang rose through the ranks, Li filled the position that Zhang left behind. So it's it's almost like when Zhang got promoted, he promoted Li to fill his position. So for example, Li. Li Li Shangfu replaced Zhang Youxia as the commander of the manned space program.、Um, he also replaced Zhang as the commander of the equipment development department. So Li and Zhang are both, and also they are both princelings, and whose fathers were senior PLA officers. So the two are very close, obviously. So if Li got into trouble, Zhang will be he- held liable, just like what. Uh, Colonel Yao said in the video clip that I played. He said, when they investigated the rocket force problems, and they find that the root problem rests on Wei Fenghe, who was the,、uh, the 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 inaugurate commander of the rocket force. By the same token, when they investigated the equipment development department,、um, I think all the problems, also the root problem, rests on Zhang Youxia. Who was the inaugural commander of the equipment development department? So, you know, and so that's what I say. I'm not surprised if something,、uh, if, if Xi Jinping find something、uh, went wrong with Zhang Youxia, his second command in the PLA. Now, the post. Let me give you this. This is the Chinese. So this this is it's long. I only translated the parts that are relevant here. But if you, but the post also said that the number of officers in the rocket force and equipment development department,、uh, Xi Jinping has removed, are in three digits. Are in three digits. That's scary. And so this is not a pretty picture for Xi Jinping. The question is why? Why is he tearing his own? I mean, the the troop that he established. Apart, why is he taking down so many officers that he promoted? This post also said that the the officers have been promoted at least three times, or on average three times in the past ten years, and these are all officers that he handpicked and promoted. Um, <clears throat> and let me just come back. So, the quick answer is fear. Xi Jinping fears that the rocket force will stage a coup d'état against him. Colonel Yao Chen said that Xi Jinping is afraid to fly in airplanes, and afraid that the PLA or the rocket force, or or the PLA will use a rocket to shut down his plane. And in my August twenty sixth program titled "Xi's Mental State,"、uh, I share with you two prophecies 
or two prophecy books that Xi Jinping is very aware of. And in the famous Tang Dynasty prophecy book, Pushback Diagram, and that's probably the most famous prophecy book uh, in China. This, this is the one. Uh, in the 40, 46 diagram, it described a palace coup with Xi Jinping's name mentioned. Um, this is all discussed in my 26 program. I'm just going to, I'm quickly giving you a, a recap. So there's a, a poem um, that said, there is a soldier with a bow claiming he's a white headed man. In the Eastern gate, he ambushed with a golden sword and the warrior entered the palace through the back door. And we know that the white headed man um, is, is, in traditional form is Xi Jinping. And here's, you know, if you take out, if you break down the parts, you know, his last name is, she is white feather. And so you have, you know, you all the parts in the white headed man is white, is basically Xi Jinping. Um, now the troublemaker is the soldier with a bow, right? And, Xi Jinping is, I mean, the question is, who is the soldier with a bow? Um, somehow Xi Jinping is convinced that the bow is rockets. Um, and this has an anecdote. So the rocket force was formerly known as the second, it was, a, it was established as a secret military service and was called the Second Artillery Corps. The founding general of the Second Artillery Corps was um, Zhang Aiping, whose picture I'm showing here. And he wrote two poems in 1983 and 1986 uh, for the 2nd Artillery Corps. And he used the word bow in them. And he said, I will pull the carved bow and fly arrows. And it came from a famous Song Dynasty poem, which reads, I will pull the carved bow like the full moon, look to the northwest and shoot at the sky wolves. So anecdotally, arrows and bows are, I mean, arrows are the rockets and bow and the bow is the launching pad, right? So no matter how, how you look at it, you know, it's just very, very obvious that bow is associated with rocket. And so in Xi Jinping's mind, the rocket force you know, has a high likely chance of um, staging a coup. And also the rocket force has a history um, that's tied to the, the princelings. And, um, and also it, it's, it's highly educated because it involves a rocket. So it's high tech. Uh, people in the rocket force are well educated. They tend to have a, a link to the press princelings and, and they seem to have a mind of their own and they have independent thinking. So, um, and there have been rumors saying that people in the rocket force of, are, and you know, are against, are against war um, with Taiwan. So we put all of that together. Xi Jinping is very fearful of the rocket force. Now, historically Mao, Mao's chosen successor, Lin Biao died in an air crash. And the recent um, tra uh, tragedy or downing of the Wagner Group's airplane made Xi Jinping and his um, circle of people very, very nervous. And this is according to Colonel Yao. And he is certainly afraid that the rocket force or, or somebody in the PLA will shoot down his plane. And I'm not saying this um, without evidence. Now, if you think about it, when Xi Jinping left South Africa in the evening of August 24th to return China, he didn't fly directly back to Beijing. He stopped in Xinjiang and waited for a day before showing up in Xinjiang on August 26th to meet with the local officials. His itinerary is unusual because there's nothing pressing in Xinjiang for him. And if you really look at everything that's happening in China, there's so many press, pressing issues for him to deal with in Beijing, right? The economy, um, foreign relations. I mean, there's just so many other issues that 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 are waiting for him, that we're waiting for him. 
So why why did he stop in Xinjiang? And what's even more unusual is that the Xinhua News said that the CCP officials attending the meetings with him in Xinjiang include, okay, let me tell you who they are, uh, Cai Qi, the director of the general office of the of CCP's Central Committee, uh, Cai Qi is like the his um, metro d, you know, like his his housekeeper, um, the CCP's housekeeper, right? His uh, CAA, his chief admin officer, who runs the CCP household for him. So Cai Qi was there. Well, Cai Qi accompanied him to um, to South Africa, so he would be there. And then Wang Yi, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And Shi Taifeng, the Minister of the United From Work Department, and uh, Li Ganjie, the Minister of the Central Organization Department. The organization uh, uh, department is responsible for promote personnel issues, promotion and demotion, or personnel issues. Um, the head of the and also He Weidong, the Vice Chairman of the Central Military Commission, was there. Uh, he Lifeng, Vice Premier of the State Council, who's in charge of the economy, right? Who's the highest ranking official in charge of the economy under, under Li Qiang, the Premier. Chen Wenqing, the Secretary of the Central Political and Legal Affairs Commission. Uh, he, is, he is given the name of the spy chief. And then Wang Xiaohong, the Minister of the Ministry of Public Security, right? Who's in charge of uh, internal public security. Did you find something odd here? It looks like Xi Jinping brought with him almost his entire cabinet or the most important people that report to him to Xinjiang. But what, what's going on in Xinjiang? There isn't anything major that requires all of these people attending. So people who are f familiar with China affairs believe that Xi Jinping was afraid to return to Beijing immediately from South Africa. As soon as his plane entered China's airspace in the West, he landed in Xinjiang uh, because that's the, uh, that's the West, that's the province in the, in the outermost Western region of China. He was afraid that his plane would be shot down by a rocket or he was afraid to fly into inner China. So he landed and then he, probably traveled by ground transportation train, most most likely the train. Um, I think the officials that went to, that attended the meetings in Xinjiang, I don't believe they all went to South Africa with him to attend the BRICS summit. I think some of them went to Xinjiang to meet with him there to, to do their work and probably took the train with him to return to Beijing. And, and they probably worked on the train. So you see how he was afraid to return to Beijing immediately and took the time to stay in Xinjiang and then and required his officials to meet him there. And they, and they probably returned through some kind of road transportation. That I don't know. Um, Yao Chen, I read a media report where uh, Yao Chen gave, said, uh, gave another interview and said that there's very little chance for PLA to organize an uprising um, given the amount of surveillance that's installed within the PLA. But he did point out that all the PLA units are equipped with what he, called, what he said, the Red Flag 16 anti-aircraft missiles. And he said mid-ranked officers can order that. And, and that's why Xi Jinping is so afraid to fly um, his own airplane in China, in China's own airspace. Um, so for that reason, I don't think Xi Jinping is going to the APEC summit in San Francisco to meet with uh, Joe Biden. China announced yesterday that its foreign minister Wang Yi isn't coming to the UN meeting in New York, and instead China will send its vice president Han Zhen. Now, the most significant role for Wang's trip to come to New York is not so much UN, but rather it's a preparation meeting with his American counterpart in New York to prepare for a potential Biden-Xi meeting in San Francisco. But if she isn't coming, I think it's probably not necessary for Juan to come to the US either. 
Xi Jinping is said to have people with supernormal abilities、um, on his to 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 help him to guide him because he's so concerned with、um, losing his life during his term due to the prophecies. Now, I think there's a way out for him if he studies the prophecy close、uh, closely enough. Uh, prophecy books are written in in a very vague manners. People usually don't know.、Uh, a, people usually can't really read into them until it's you know when the event has already happened.、Um, so so sometimes the prophecies are written with possible interpretations, right? They're、uh, intentionally left vague so they don't. Give everything out. It's subject to people's understanding and interpretation.、Um, and let me let me show you the the this again. Let me make this bigger. So if you read that again, I fixed my translation so that it's more accurate. And if you if you read if you read it again, said there was a soldier with a bow claiming he is a white headed man. In the eastern gate, he ambushed with a golden sword. The warrior entered the palace through the back door. So I think there are two possible、uh, interpretation. One is Xi Jinping will face a coup d'état with a soldier with a bow,、um, and then and and that's that's what he is. Uh, that's why he's fearing. But the other possible interpretation, after I fix the English translation, is Xi Jinping is the man staging a coup d'état. He is the man with a bow、uh, entering the palace, staging a coup d'état. Right, because he claiming he is. Because there was a soldier with a bow claiming he is a white-headed man, and we know the white-headed the white-headed man is Xi Jinping. So that's the second interpretation. If you really read it carefully, so what that implies is Xi Jinping is the man that's possibly、uh, that will end the the regime, the CCP regime.、Um, It it will you know if because if I mean if, if you if you look at from from this translation I mean it's possible he is the one who will end the 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 CCP regime the the Red Dynasty with a bow.、Um, so I think this prophecy can really go either way depend depending on how he looks at it.、Um, many people do believe that Xi Jinping is the one who. Uh, the 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 CCP dynasty will end with him,、uh, so he has a choice of either ending end it with a bow himself, or you know being subject to a coup d'état like the one he's that he fears.、Um, that's pretty much my presentation. But I want to play you、um, another video clip from Colonel Yao. Who sort of describes how Xi Jinping is conducting the internal cleansing within the PLA, and how he does that? And I find it because we're really dealing with reality and prophecy. It's it's kind of hard because prophecy is, I mean, it's just a cultural belief that's very strong on people's mind. It certainly is has a huge impact on Xi Jinping's mind. He does believe that,、um, but on the other hand. You know, we do need to take a look at realistically what's happening、um, within the PLA, what he is actually doing. So, I don't want to. I want to have a blended view to present the issue. You know, because some people could just look at the prophecy as a strictly from a very abstract,、uh, cultural, or, or even a spiritual perspective of the subject, and other people.、Um, Opt to look at it from a very Western factual based,、uh, fact based approach to review the matter. I don't want to leave out either. I want to have a hybrid approach because both matters. So I want to leave you with the next clip that sort of describes what Xi Jinping is doing within the PLA, and it's from from、um, from Yao Chen. So if I could find the video, okay, here we go.
现在笼罩在一片恐慌之中为什么呢这个习近平上台以后大概是在军改以后二零一七年以后在军队建立了一个巡视制度就是对军以上机关和监军以上的干部要进行巡视他这个巡视他倒不对他要听下面的说法有的人比如说举报啊什么的呃上级巡视组来了我们要举报这是一个第二个呢就是呃习近平在在这个军队现在的动作呢整个的动作呢他是抓政委他好几个战区军区军种的政委他在后调你比如说给战区的政委调到中
of, uh, Jesus is coming. Lei, you think if she dies, will there be a civil war in China? I think if she dies, the, the regime will collapse. Uh, I don't think there will be a civil war in China because I think people, I think there will be a, a, a very strong, there will be one voice. Chinese people will ask for a democratic government. I think there will be some serious change in China for the better. Um, okay, let's see. From, from Praveen Mathur, do you think she's afraid of his army? I think he is. I think he is. Um, from Amara Dambuya, is she playing with fire? All CCP leaders, from Mao to Deng, they're all, they have been playing with nothing but fire. It's not just Xi Jinping, right? NTN, Lei, you mentioned that China will likely go back to pre-WTO level. Analyst Charlene Chu says China is going back to 1970s level. How much is the difference from 1970s to 2000? Um, I think the difference between 1970s to 2000 is smaller than the difference between 2000 and now in China. So the fact that she said that China will go back to the 1970s is, is, is similar to my statement that China will go to the pre-WTO years. Um, the reason why, why I say go to the pre, because technology, it's hard. I mean, economically, it may be, you know, some, the, the scale of the scale of the level of poverty that will exist in Chinese society will be similar to the 1970s. But in terms of technology, I don't think we'll go back to the 1970s. I think technology wise, we'll go back to the 1999 era. So it's hard to see society regressing to 1970s. So it's not just a pure economic regression. There's also technological regression. Um, I, I think we may even lose the internet if a war breaks out because so much there will be, you know, the cyberspace is, is going to be a major battleground. So for countries to protect their citizens, to protect their online properties, they will have to cut, they have to cut the internet, you know, I mean, it will become like a, su a supersized intranet within the United States. Um, so, so yeah, so if a war breaks out, the internet will not be what it is today. It will become, you know, a segmented intranet. It will be in several intranets, and then it would defeat the purpose of having the internet, right? If it's just a, a large size or several large sized intranets run by its own government, then it lose it will lose its purpose. So. So the technology, yeah, so cyber war will, will you know, will bring down the internet. That's, that's just my assessment. Uh, so don't be surprised. Don't, you know, uh, don't be surprised. We'll go back to the, uh, the good old days when we have to hand in cash to buy things. Um, keep your uh, analog phones. Who knows? All right. Carolyn... Fitzgerald, Lei, what's what is why is prophecy so important in China when the perception is that <coughs> that completely secular? Why does she think that prophecy has any meaning? Uh, prophecy is very important. Fortune telling, feng shui, like you you know, feng shui is so important in Chinese people's life, and fortune telling. Um, um, a prophecy is is fortune telling, right? Prophecy is for, fortune telling for a nation, and and Chinese believe in prophecy because the prof, there's so many prophecy books that have accurately predicted historical events and dynastic changes. The book I mentioned, uh, Tui Bei Tu, Pushback Diagrams, have accurately predicted Chinese history up until I think it's Ming Dynasty, yeah, for like. It, it was written in the Tang Dynasty, so it was written in the in between this, I think eight hundred, eight hundred, 
um, AC. So it predicted for a thousand of years after that. And then other events, and then after the, the Ming Dynasty or maybe the Qin Dynasty, the events are, before that, the, the prophecies, it was sequential. So you could, you could match the prophecy with each dynasty and they, they correlate and they're very accurate. Right, and then after that, the time the timeline was intentionally uh, changed, so people cannot follow the timeline. So people, but they still accurately predicted many events up until now. They're just not in the right order, and and people say the accuracy before the Ming Dynasty is hundred percent. It's a hundred percent accurate. So that's why Chinese people believe in that. And, and I know for Westerners, it's probably hard to believe. You think that's just, uh, it is, it is. Um, so people who, who study astrologies, you know, famous astrologists, they have the ability to see the future. Um, this is because in, in different, different time dimensions, the speed of time is different, right? So you actually see things ahead of time because they already exist there. We're in different time dimensions. So we feel like it's oh, a thousand years, maybe in other dimension, it's just, uh, it's very fast. So because of this time difference, people um, who study astrologies or very accomplished astrologists, they are able to know events ahead of time because they already exist in time, time dimensions that, that that uh, that have a different time speed, so it's explained scientifically. Anyways, so it's it has it's very very important, and almost all Chinese uh, CCP leaders like Mao, Jiang Zemin. I don't know about Hu Jintao, but Jiang Zemin, Mao Zedong, and Xi Jinping. You know, all believe that um, very strongly. So, um, yeah. Okay, from Yoming. Lei, is she getting more paranoid due to his scolding at Beidaihe, or is it something else? Oh, look at the pressure he's under, right? So there's so many people against him, and things are not going well for him. You know, his military is going through so many crises. The economy is, like, tanking, is, is on a free fall without any <coughs> remedy to rescue. So if you look at him, it's just things are going so wrong in all directions for him. And how could he not be paranoid? And people are up against him. Um, now, as far as the, his scolding at Beidaihe, uh, the, the Nikkei Asia article that came out last week, I talked about that. Some China analysts believe that it's not real. It's a propaganda piece. The event did not happen the way it, it was described in the article, but the information was intentionally released to a foreign press to create that impression. And the person and the party who released that information obviously is Xi Jinping's number one enemy, you know, the Zhenqing Hong faction. Uh, they, the, the reason, and I read the other view, and I think it's logical. This is because it's the way they describe how, you know, the retired CCP elders got together, they had a meeting, they sent a few delegates to attend the Beidaihe meeting and gave Xi Jinping a warning. And the person who kind of organized this was Zheng Qinghong. It's not Zheng Qinghong's style. It's not how he would do things. And it's this this is more of a Western approach to do things. It's not how CCP's, this is not how Xi Jinping's enemies would do things, right? Uh, no, it, 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 and I think that view is, if you know uh, the CCP politics well enough, that's not how they would do it. Um, so that meeting probably didn't take place, but this, this piece of information is intentionally released to a foreign press to make us believe so. Um, and um, yeah, and so that's just a, just, just a thought. From Ptolemyo Salamancha, could the CCP elders actually remove Xi at this point? She has done so much to eliminate his opponents, I find it very unlikely. No, yes, I don't think it's likely, but who knows, right? It, I think that the, the, the key will be, Traditionally, whoever controls the military, 
whoever controls the gun will have the ultimate control of the regime. So, so Xi Jinping is is trying to hold on to the PLA. But if all the problems that I went through with you earlier today is true, all of those claims are true. All these people, the two defense ministers, and his um, the second command in the PLA is also being investigated. If all of that, if all of those claims are true, then he doesn't have a good con control or command of the PLA, then that's a, a scary thought for him. Um, but does that mean that other CCP elders are able to command the PLA? Uh, I don't think so. Um, so it's, it's hard to say. And also, uh, if you watch the last video that I played before the Q&A, you know, Yao Chen explained how, she, you know, despite the chaos or the internal, the mass scale internal investigations, Xi Jinping still has some control because he has built in this inspection uh, system. He is sending in so many inspection teams to, to get the feedback from the grassroots. Now within the PLA, there are always people at the grassroots level who are upset with their superior who may turn against them. So, um, I think to some extent, Xi Jinping is still the person who has the most control within the PLA. All right, let me see. Um, from Chinese Pride, it seems like Xi is the greatest threat to China. Would all of China's problems be solved if he's removed from the equation? No. It depends on if he's removed, who will be taking his place? Do you think that those people who oppose Xi Jinping are all benign to China? No. Only those people who truly adv advocate for a democratic China, who, who advocate a real political reform, uh, will bring good changes to China. But if those people who oppose Xi Jinping, other CCP princelings who want to overthrow Xi Jinping and who want to continue to, you know, continue the CCP regime, I think things could, there's no difference. Things could be even worse um, because some of his opponents are more brutal than he is, you know. So it depends on, you know, what will who will be in power. I think the biggest problem is the CCP, you know. Thank you, boy, Kachina. All right, let me see. Oh, from, from Hector Bacchus. Lei, do you think that Terry Gao running for Taiwan president would drastically change the prospect of war with China? Uh, Terry Gao's running for Taiwan will well, it's bad news for the Kuomintang, the party that the CCP wants to win in the next presidential election, because he will be, uh, the, their their voters will be divided three ways. Um, and then so that makes them <coughs> less likely to compete with uh, Tsai Ing-wen's DPP. Does that mean that the prospect of war with China would be increased? I don't know. I I have not thought about that. I I'm I'm not convinced that there is a direct link right now, but I'll I'll keep thinking about it. Thank you for the question. That's a good question. All right. Um let's see. From Kanji2136, Lei, does this increase the chance of a Taiwan invasion? Um, didn't we see experts in the past day or so, military experts? renowned military experts who have spoken up in the last two day or so saying that they don't see the threat of a war in the immediate future because the PLA is not ready. And I think I agree with that statement because, you know, from Xi Jinping's perspective, I mean, things are going, things are wild within the PLA. Look at the, the number of issues he has to deal with. Um, I don't think he's ready, but the risk increase increases because I think right now the risk of war is out of Xi Jinping and Joe Biden's hands. Um, I think things will go wrong 
so dramatically for Xi Jinping, and he's playing defense. And he, he you know, I said this in Taiwan when I was interviewed by a Taiwanese media. He will be making decisions reactively or pass reactively and passively, so things will go wrong. Um, and then they will. He will do things passively to a point that he would push himself into a corner, where he had no other choice but to start a war against his own will. And that's what I'm afraid. It's not because because people often think, oh, maybe Xi Jinping is thinking, I want to start a war to save myself out of this trouble. No, he doesn't. He he as as much people would like to believe that he. Is crazy or short-sighted? There, I think he's still logical in a sense that he knows he shouldn't start a war without being prepared. So I don't think he will start a war like that. But the problem, if you look at the pattern, if you look at the, the how things have changed, right? How Sino-U.S. relations have changed um, or deteriorated so fast since the balloon spy balloon incident. I mean, now, like Xi Jinping and Biden are even not meeting with each other.、Um, I think things just turn out to be that way against Xi Jinping and Joe Biden's wish. Now, Xi Jinping is not coming to meet with Joe Biden. They're not going to talk about it face to face. And Wang Yi, the prime,、uh, the foreign minister, isn't even coming to New York to meet with his counterpart. So. It's against their wish, but the way the politics is 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 running against Xi Jinping is forcing him to take these measures that have increased the risk of war against his wish. So that's what I think is scary. He is in a passive mode.、Um, so, yeah. All right. Carolyn Fitzroy, Fitzgerald, wow, that's really interesting. Thank you for answering my question so thoroughly. I really appreciate it. The CCP is seen as a secular. I was surprised. Thank you. All right, thank you.、Um, voice voices on Espanol late. She is surrounded by yes men. Is it possible he has no clue about how bad the Chinese economy has gotten? I think. Yes, you're right. He is surrounded by yes men.、Uh, sometimes he's shielded from knowing the reality, but I think he knows how bad the Chinese economy is. He knows. He knows that. He doesn't know that now. He knew that a few years ago.、Um, he knew that the Chinese Chinese economy would, would was in a very bad situation a few years ago. So,、um, so he knew, but he may not knew exactly what's happening on the ground every day, because people have shielded them、um, from him now. <clears throat> if China become from multicolor, if China become becomes a democratic <coughs> country, I will immigrate there. Yeah, I would too. Um. Say, let's see. Let's see.、Um, okay, I'm just trying to pick a question that from someone that I haven't addressed before. <laughs> let's see. From Peter, given the major changes made by Xi within the military commands, do you think an assault on Taiwan would be a disaster for the PLA? Of course, it's a disaster for the PLA. But does the CCP leaders ever care if it's a disaster for the PLA?、Um, watch my videos on on the three wars that CCP has fought. It, it was war is a way for them to obtain political power at the cost of、uh, sacrificing the Chinese people and the PLA、um, servicemen. All right, let's see. From Navin Bratia, Le, who will be Xi's successors? We don't know. There hasn't been anyone appointed. He may have someone in mind, but you know, like I said, the risk of having a the risk for dictators to appoint a successor is that once someone is appointed, that person 
inevitably become the subject of jealousy and attack, and that person will be ruined. So dictators, and also throughout Chinese histories, sometimes ep emperors do not like to have their successor to be known um, until the very last stage. All right, um, I'll take two more questions and I think that's it. Wow, um, there are a lot of discussions. From Jairo Herrera, even if the regime collapses, do you think there should be a mandatory effort to re-educate the whole population in order to eliminate the little pinks from forming a second CCP? I think that's very important and very necessary. If you look at uh, the lessons we learned from Russia, so even the Communist Party collapsed, but the outside world, as well as uh, people in Russia, did, did not go through the due diligence or the extra effort to really eliminate the the harm that the communist or totalitarian regime regimes have on 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 its society its people and its politics right so there isn't enough effort to really help the 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 russian people um and also the outside people to understand the harm communism has caused we didn't do enough of that in Russia and also some of its, some of the other republics. So we need to do that in China, um, because because the real the real enemy the real enemy is the ideology and the the behavior, the thinking, the mindset. You know how the the communist ideology has changed the way how Chinese people think and interact with each other, how they view the outside world. Um, and we need to really go through a conscious exercise. Otherwise, you're right, we could have a second generation of CCP. NTN, do you think what do you think of the announcement at G20 about the economic corridor plan? It looks like it <coughs> it counters the the Belt and Road Initiative. How much damage can it do to the Belt and Road? I don't think the Belt and Road is. I mean, it it can barely survive right now, right? So the the it's the debt problems it caused in the country that in the countries that sign up, and also the credit crisis. Um, in China, because if you have all these debt that you can't get paid, I mean, it creates a pressure on the Chinese banks, the the state bank, the state owned banks. So it's a problem on both ends. So I don't think it's the, the project. It's like an empty shell right now. It only exists superficially. Um, the the illusion that it still exists is there, but in essence, it's. There's, there's no substance. All right. Um, um, unconventional ideas. How, how likely is it that nobody has good control over a majority of China's military assets owing to internal political divisions? Um, I think that should be a legitimate concern in the West, because if you look at China's development over the past 12 months, or less than 12, I would say 10 months since October, since the Party Congress, I think the CCP and its apparatus, its class of officials, have adopted, the internal political struggle has forced a lot of the officials, both in the in civilian and also in the military, have uh, adopted a, a, a do nothing, you know, lay flat approach because they don't know what to do. They get confused by the internal politics, or they they get feared. They get they, they get uh, fearful of the internal politics, so they don't do anything. And when that happens, you have all these random things that would happen, right? It's it's a system like the the recent um, the nuclear the the Inner Mongolia nuclear mine that the the coal mine meltdown to me that's that's just a 
that's just one of the many man-made disasters that China is experiencing right now due to due to this in, due to the in, an institutional in, institutional um, dysfunction. Um, I read that some of the cities have so many fires and building collapses. I mean, we've seen these news like nonstop in the past couple of months. You know why? Because the housing inspectors are not working, right? During the pandemic, they shut down. All the government functions have stopped for so long during zero COVID. So, and now even though they are reopened, they lost these functions. So housing inspections, all these safety measures that are very important part of modern cities or modern metropolises are gone, right? So not just the modern cities, but like mines, you know, all these security, um, basically <laughs> the government functions, you know, it, it are disabled. So you have all, you know, the... It, <laughs> I mean, what would society society be like? A modern society is run on these very intricate uh, rules and regulations, and you know, people have to follow the rules so that a modern society can run. But it's gone, so it's become it has. I just think it's highly dangerous when China has so many hardwares that are not hardware that are not being operated maintained and operated correctly uh, with the right procedure, with the right mindset, with the right groups of people, that just worries me. And this is what I told to my friends in China. I said, you may think that you live in a wealthy neighborhood in Shanghai, in Beijing, and you think whatever happens uh, in rural China or in, in Mongolia will not affect you. But do you know that this whole system is already dysfunctional and you don't know what's going to happen in the building next to you because, you know, because it has not been inspected. It could be a gas leak. It could be anything. So, and that's what I fear. So I think this concern uh, is legitimate and not just within the military, but throughout China in terms of natural disaster, in terms of, um, yeah, so the fact that having China go through this chaotic stage is not a good thing for the world. Um, it's definitely not good for Chinese people. But even just because we don't live there, it doesn't mean that it's good for the globe. I, I think the Western government need to seriously think about the, the environmental, the the geo, not just the geopolitical, the environmental. I mean, all the risks associated with um, the second largest country being run in a lawless manner, you know, with all these technology, with all these weapons, with all these um, natural resources just running, you know, in a lawless manner. That frightens me. All right, I'll take one last question, and I think we should return to the weekend mode. All right. Um, oh, I see one question from from I'll take I take this question from someone who have, haven't answered. Lay what from Scala Sla, Scala Tuck twenty seven. Lay what has happened about the submarine crash effort? Is there any evidence of a recovery effort of the submarine? Um, I have not seen anything other than I, I heard that it was um it was a mechanical failure. Um in it, it happened in the yellow in the in the Yellow Sea. It was a me mechanical failure and the the vessel lost oxygen, so people on board suffocated to death. And it was hard for them to rescue the vessel because they, they had a storm. Um I think the it went down. The vessel went down eight eight a.m. in the morning, and by the time they got it up, it was two p.m. in the afternoon. And there was some mechanical failure. It got caught. Oh, I think it, it got caught with some kind of cable, and it lost oxygen. But I don't understand why um, such an advanced um, submarine would lose 
oxygen in six hours. It, it, it's unthinkable, right? It's only six hours, but but they said that the rescue effort was delayed because there was a storm um, in the Yellow Sea at the time when it happened. So who knows what happened? The last time when the Chinese Navy submarine had an accident, it was in 2000, 2003 or 2006. Um, but it was, it was, it was a man-made disaster because it was a disgruntled officer who was very upset with with um, his upcoming retirement. And it was said that he intentionally shut off the air intake valve on the vessel. And so, so that was a suicidal act. Who knows what happened there? I found it hard to believe that such an advanced submarine could lose oxygen within six hours. All right, I think that's quite a, we talked for, and I talked for an hour and 15 minutes. This is wonderful. And I thank you for joining me and I'll see you next week. Oh, this week. I'll see you this week. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. All right, I'll see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye.